here in enough time so that Marta didn't have to start another song, but <laughs> thank you so much. Beautiful, beautiful music to get us started. Um, Want to let folks know a few things uh, schedule-wise. Uh, remind you that next Sunday is, and it's not going to come as a surprise, Christmas Day. And I know you probably all have plans for Christmas Day. Um, I hope that you will make coming to 11 o'clock services part of those plans. We will be having 11 o'clock services on Christmas Day here. Uh, Sunday school will be postponed and, uh, and early service will be uh, postponed. So we're just going to have that one period of time, 11 o'clock, to worship together. So if you're normally coming at a different time, you are you know, asked to kind of adjust your schedule a little bit. It'll be a good time of uh, seeing the good songs and hearing the word. And so we want to invite you to come and participate in that. The night before... Remind you of our Christmas Eve services, which are at 5 o'clock and at 8 o'clock, candlelight services both. It's still pretty light at 5, so if that's an issue for folks driving and whatnot, I encourage you to that. That first service is our memorial service. We do spend a little time reflecting on those that uh, we've, kinda, we've had to say goodbye to this year, so we want to invite you to either one of those services as well. Um, we are going to go back to regular programming on the first because the following Sunday after Christmas is New Year's Day and I know some of you may stay up late to uh, ring in the new year. Well, you can take a nap in the afternoon. So come to church on Christmas Day. We will have our regular 8.30 service, our uh, regular Sunday school, Sunday school uh, time and then our regular 11 o'clock service. So back on the regular schedule at the first of the year, a great way to start the year. Um, also want to remind folks that this week, uh, men's Bible study will be at the regular time. Uh, they canceled last week because of weather conditions, but it is uh, uh, going to be going to happen this week again. So you're encouraged to come and participate in that. Um, I haven't heard about women's Bible study. You guys going to meet this week? Okay, so women's Bible study here at the church as well. So on Tuesday, it'll be a busy day. I um, want to invite you all to those events. Um, I think that's all... I'll probably forget something, but uh, at any rate, I think I got most of the things. Sherry has some presentations she'd like to make. As you know, we're all blessed by, by John and Tasha and Cyrus being, um, being in our church and the Ministry Commission and congregation is presenting this Christmas gift to them uh, for all they have done for us, all the, all the times that they've touched our lives. Hmm. We appreciate it very much, and so Merry Christmas to you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Oh. <laughs> well. Good morning. How is everyone this morning? So we are here to present our animals today. Everyone has their sign up that says how many we found. Oops, I'm not doing very well. Um, two heifers. We have five sheep, four alpacas, ten ducks, three honeybees, ten goats, 17 chickens, and six pigs, I think. You have six pigs, I agree? Okay. So the kids had a great time doing this. Um, and we are just hoping that we can buy all of these animals that they found. So there's still time to donate to the Heifer Project. And thank you so much for all of your donations.
I'm not taking a selfie either. <laughs> you know, the kids have done a great job, and uh, the cause is a noble one, and it helps so many people. So, you know, the donations helping us get to that goal, help the kids get to that goal. I, I remember Reverend Ike used to be on the radio years ago, and I loved the guy. But he said, get on there, and he goes, tonight's Cadillac night. A Cadillac, $7,450. That's what we got to raise tonight. And he says, I know it can be a burden to some, but he goes, God knows. You know, but that's what we need to raise to make God's mission. And I thought, man, this guy is truthful. He is right to the point. He doesn't pull any punches. I remember Pontiac, Pontiac night, but Cadillac night, $7,450. But we're not that heavy handed here. So anyway. I want to welcome everyone today, and if you're visiting, please, we hope you feel at home and consider this your home church today. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Wanda and Steve over there, and they've been worshiping with us for several months now, I think, and uh, I didn't recognize Wanda for a couple of weeks until she nailed me out in the parking lot. And I go, whoa. But we go way back. And it has to do with corn dogs. <laughs> I worked with Wanda and her husband then. And they had a corn dog stand. And, and I don't know anyone that didn't work there in high school. I mean, we all did. Party pups. And... Uh, so anyway, it's good to see old friends. And let's not be a stranger to each other. You know, Jesus exhorted us to not be a stranger, to help those we don't know. So it's kind of hard sometimes because some people are just jerks and it's kind of like, eh, don't think so. But that's the challenge. Okay. Our reading today is Psalms 80, 1 through 7, and 17 to 19. O he hear us, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubs since forth before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Awaken your might. Come and save us. There's a theme here. Restore us, O God. Make your face shine upon us. O Lord God Almighty, how long will your anger smolder against the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have made them drink tears by the bowlful. You have made us a source of contention to our neighbors and our enemies mock us. Restore us, O God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. 17 and 19. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of man you have raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us, and we will call on your name. Restore us, O Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us, that we may be saved. May we bow our heads. Dear God, it is that time of the year where people act surprised that the birth of your son is in celebration again. But it happens every year, and we are so grateful. May we be more cognizant of what you do for us and what your son has brought us. Amen. If you'd all stand with me, we're going to start with Joy to the World on 318.
197, Angels We Have Heard on High. You know, all of us in our lives at one time have asked God, you know, for something. And can you think of what God delivered? When you realize God answered your prayer, how that made you feel. What we give in our tithing here reaches out to people we don't even know. Some here, some outside our church. And this time of the year seems to bring out the needs and the wants of people, those that don't have very much, those that are in dire need. And whatever we give, however it touches somebody, it's a gift from God.
you know, what I was talking about is a selfish prayer. You know, God help me. But as we pray, we also ask God to help those that may need something, those that are in need. And what a blessing when God does help them that we pray for. And it just shows the power of God. But it's the power of prayer. May we bow our heads. Thank you, God, for your son, Jesus. This time in a year, we think of the birth of your son, what it means to us, what it means to the world. And may we never forget that. In Jesus' name. Salvation. That's not a bad word for an Advent candle, but couldn't we just call it the candle of joy? Of course we could. This is the most joyous season. The angel brought the words to the shepherd, good news of great joy, therefore the most joyous of seasons. And the reason for that joy was that there was a Savior born in the city of David. We rejoice in the salvation that is ours in Jesus Christ. We lighted the candle of salvation, joy. If you would all join me again standing as we sing Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Star.
Guide us to that perfect light. I'd like to invite you to take your Bibles today and turn to Matthew's Gospel, the first chapter, reading from well, what we might understand is the traditional Christmas story a little bit here in that first part of the Matthew's Gospel. Beginning in the 18th verse, now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit, her husband Joseph, being a righteous man, and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son And he named him Jesus. Stained glass has been a part of church architecture for a long time. One of the earliest examples is from St. Paul's Monastery in Jarrow, England. That dates from the 7th century. This glass behind me is a lot newer. It's uh, much more recent, obviously, 
This was actually on the front of the building that we had over on 11th Street. It was part of the church there, and they, they took it out and moved it over here when they built this church back in the 90s. They call this a, a, a rose window, uh, because back when they were first starting to do these things and laying them out, putting them into churches, this circular design, it kind of resembled like the petals of a flower, a rose that gave it its name. They're coming for somebody. We'll pray that it's nothing serious. Back in 2019, you probably saw this on the news, uh, the cathedral in Paris, Notre Dame Cathedral, caught on fire and it burned. Uh, much of the structure was destroyed. And one of the major concerns that they had there was the cathedral's great, three great rose windows. These stained glass windows, they would be nearly impossible to replace. Fortunately, the fire spared them, and they're currently in the middle of a long and uh, painstaking process of cleaning and, and restoration. These three rose windows in Notre Dame, they're masterpieces of Gothic glasswork. The cathedral has over 1,100 square feet of stained glass, a, a, a modest house size of stained glass, and the crowning jewels are these three great rose windows. Each of the windows dates back to the 13th century, a long, long time ago. Two of them contain most of the original glass. Nobody knows who designed them or, or created these windows. Like the cathedrals themselves, they were probably constructed over a very long period of time by numerous talented craftsmen. Stained glass was used to tell the story of the church. We're talking about a congregation, a body that was mostly illiterate. They didn't know how to read. Many of them didn't understand the Latin language that was used in the recitation of Scripture, and there was no Bible that was accessible to them. And so these windows, uh, during the services, you could imagine them sitting in the darkened cathedrals with their eyes wandering around, looking at the stained glass, and they would see these images depicted there, the saints, the biblical characters, the personification of theological truths. Somebody in their past had told them, years before perhaps, that it had shared the story with them. This is John the Baptist, and, and this represents Peter, and, and these are the vices and virtues, and so on. And then quietly, perhaps, they would lean over to their kids and tell them the story as, as it had been shared with them. This is stained glass. Its transparency illuminates the interior of the darkened building. It's meant as a window to let in light. And Notre Dame has some of the most vivid and vibrant colors of glass. These rich red crimsons, the glistening greens, the blues. The blues were created by lapis lazuli in the, in the firing process. That came from Afghanistan, far, far away. And each of these colors, it's a unique piece of glass cut in a specific shape, bedded into a glazing that holds the whole pane together. The glazings, they're called kames. They either come in a U shape or an H shape, depending on what side holds the glass. And those get supported by bars or barring, they call it. It prevents the irregular mosaic of the glass from sagging under its own weight. But you can't have too much of this structure. You can't have too many kames, too much barring. It all has to be as discreet as possible so that the image comes through, so that the light shines through. When you get right up to the glass, up close, you can see all these little details that go into the making of the window, all the structure, the intricately shaped pieces of glass, the delicate selection of, of this particular piece in order to make this certain special effect. But up close you miss the picture. These windows are meant to tell a story, one that we can't hear if we're too focused on the details, those individual parts of the story. So we need to step back and see the whole. Sometimes Christmas is like looking at an individual piece of glass in a stained glass window. Like we mentioned a while back, that only two of the Gospels actually share anything with us about the Christmas story. Mark and John, they both pick up the narrative later in, when Jesus' ministry begins. And so all we get of this story that's so precious to us 
that first Christmas, all the angels, all the prophetic messages, all the stable, the manger, the, the wise men and the gifts that we sang about, all of this comes from only half of the Gospels. And it's really only a couple chapters that we're talking about here. By the chapter 3, Luke and Matthew, they've caught up with Mark and John. And so obviously the Christmas story, it's only a small part of the whole gospel message. Only a few pieces of glass in a mighty stained glass window. The beauty, the intricacy of the whole, it's so wondrous and so majestic, it's almost overwhelming. Sometimes we do need to focus in on a specific part of it, but there's this picture that does come into view when we step back a bit and we see the whole of it. In our text today, we get a part of the story, the story that has Joseph, Jesus' adoptive father, considering this situation that he finds himself in with this pregnant girl that he's supposed to marry. Now, we've talked about this before, I know, and I know you've probably heard sermons on it in the past. We've talked about the betrothal traditions in that culture. We've talked about the way that Joseph was in a pickle here. A bit of a problem, wondering about what the best course of action might be. We've talked about the shame of the situation. It's terrible shame. It would have brought it both to Mary and to Joseph as well as their families. And that's all part of the color. The color of the glass, the beauty of the story. Imagine this. To be reassured in a, in a dream, in an angelic vision to be absolutely convinced that, yes, this is the right course of action for me to take. That's wonderful. That's a gift. But there's an element in the middle of this passage, right in the center of our text, that gives us a hint of that bigger picture. So in the middle of this passage, there's some verses that tell us a little bit about the why of Jesus. We saw it. It starts out with the story part, that narrative of Joseph and Mary. And then Matthew lets us in on the purpose of Jesus, the whole reason that Jesus is so important and why we need to pay attention. If you look at the text there, you'll see in verses 22 and 23, he mentions that Jesus will fulfill the words of the prophet. The prophet he's talking about is the prophet Isaiah. For those of you who've been in our adult Sunday school class, this might sound a little familiar to you as we go through this. Isaiah is the one that gives us a lot of this material that we, that we return to during the holiday season. He gives us the, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son material. This is where it comes from, Isaiah 7, if you're interested in looking that up. And there's a lot that's contained in Isaiah that points forward from his time to Jesus' time, points forward to the coming of the Messiah. We know this to be Jesus. The virgin conceiving and giving birth to a son, that's a prophetic sign that Isaiah shares. And it's important. But while the fulfillment of prophecy is meaningful, it does kind of validate who we're talking about here, it doesn't really get a purpose though, does it? I mean, we understand this is a fulfillment of what's already been said. What is it that Jesus is here to do? It doesn't answer that question. That actually comes in the verse before it. I hope you caught it as we read it. In verse 21, the angel tells Joseph that Mary's child, the, the, a son, is to be named Jesus. And that he will save his people from their sins. I want you to think about that one for a second. I mean, that really is an unprecedented thing to have that truth shared with you. Would you want any of your children to bear that kind of burden? That's a heavy deal. But this is what the angel tells Joseph, that he will save his people from their sins. And that's the center of the text. That's the center of the passage, really. In the whole last half of Isaiah, we see again and again and again these 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 indications, these hints about what Jesus is going to do. In a section there from, from chapters 40 through 55, there's some, some, some sections that sometimes we look at those during the Christmas season. More often we return to them at Easter. These sections are known as what the servant songs. They talk about this, this, this character that is introduced to us that's known as the servant who takes a special place in the redemptive plan of God for the people of God. Chapter 53 in Isaiah, we, we hear these words. 
and I'm sure they're going to be familiar to you. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, and yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, this is what Isaiah is telling us. And remember, Isaiah is just passing along to us what the Lord has revealed to him. He's saying that there will be this figure. We don't know who it is yet. In Isaiah's day, he doesn't know. But there will be this figure who comes into the life of the people of God, a servant. A servant who does exactly what God wants him to do. He's even going to do the stuff that nobody wants to do. He's going to do the difficult things, the painful things. He will be bruised. He will be struck down. He will be afflicted. Because this is part of God's plan and what God needs to happen. And here's the important part of all of this. All of this bruising, all of this affliction isn't just to create pain and suffering. It's there for a purpose. And again, I hope you heard it in the text. All of this is done for our sake. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. This is the picture that starts to come into focus as we step back away from the individual pieces of glass. Now Matthew's making a reference here. He's He's, when he says, spoken of by the prophet, we all know who a prophet that is. All the people that he was writing to originally would have understood that he's talking about Isaiah. And when Isaiah enters into the conversation, then all of this Christmas picture, it gets a little more clear. And if, again, you've heard this when we've gone through the book of Isaiah in our, in our study, the message of Isaiah, <laughs> it's not super comforting at times. When it talks about us, it's not that great. It's a little unsettling, in fact. Isaiah pieces together an image of human nature that's not flattering. A few chapters on, and we talked about this one in our Sunday school class this morning in chapter 59, Isaiah tells us what our problem is. See, he says, this is the very beginning, uh, first, uh, second, first two verses. See, he says, the Lord's arm is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. Rather, your iniquities have been a barrier between you and your God, and your sin has hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. It's simple. It's not confusing. It's not obscure. It's not hidden. It is illuminated very clearly. The problem is us. God is not distant or uncaring. God is not oblivious to our situation. God hasn't gone on vacation. God knows. He's very aware of the issues that we face. The Lord's arm is not too short to save. The problem is, is that we have turned away. We have gotten out of reach. We have left God, not the other way around. And so the struggles we face, and I know this is a bitter pill to swallow, the struggles that we face are, broadly speaking, self-inflicted. We've gotten ourselves into this mess through the personal choices and the consequences of the choices that others make. We're in a mess. We're in trouble. We need saved. Now, I'm not really interested in, in, in grinding through the whole sinful nature human nature arguments. Uh, I don't even know where to go on that. Are we inherently good or inherently evil? Perhaps maybe a little of both. We have been created in God's image. God has, has put his stamp on us, the imago dei, and we're part of a creation that God has called good, and so there's that. And yet we're also people with bloody hands. If you read that passage from Isaiah 59, the very next verse affirms us of this. In the end, we don't really have to sort out the interplay between good and evil in the hearts of humanity. Ultimately, as creatures, 
that fall short of the goodness of God, as we, as we learn from Paul, we need saving. That's, that's a fact. We need to be cared for. We need to be loved. We need it for our own survival. It is absolutely essential. You can see, if you want, the sin that Matthew's talking about here. You can see it in, there in verse 21. You can see that as chains that bind us and drag us down to destruction. And all of us are bound this is part of the human experience. It's just the way of it. And we need saving. To pick up on the theme that Isaiah has already developed, there are infirmities, there are diseases, there are transgressions and iniquities. These are all spiritual truths. There is a punishment that needs to be carried, a need for healing. And we will either carry the weight of that we will either bear the weight of the, ourselves and be crushed by it, which we will be, or, and this is the good part, we'll have that weight taken off of us by somebody who can carry it. Someone who can save us. You see, this is the picture that we start to get as we step back and try to take it all in. Come up close to the glass and, and you'll see the details. You'll see things like that vibrant angelic choir in the sky over those humble shepherds. You'll see the beautiful songs of Mary and Zechariah and, and Simeon. You'll see the magi and their, their glittering gifts and their adoration. And each of those special elements, each of those beautiful pieces shines a light into our hearts. But the picture isn't all about angels and mangers and shepherds and wise men. It's not about Mary and Joseph. All of those are colors in the picture, but they're not the whole of it. Christmas itself actually isn't the whole of it. Step back. Step back and take a look at the big picture, the whole luminous image, and you'll see a picture of salvation. Salvation. A picture of reconciliation, a picture of God making things right. It's a picture of healing and of new life. It is a joyous picture. You see, in that great rose window of God's plan, there's the prophet Isaiah. There's the prophet Isaiah who reminds us of our human failing. Maybe a little too much sometimes. Kind of pinches. There are pieces that represent those blood red stains on our hands. There's a shame of idolatry, the, the way that we've chosen other things instead of God. That sickly paleness of our own vanity and pride. There are pieces, pieces that, that tell us of the transgressions and the iniquities that need to be born. But there are other colors, other small stories too. There's that plea from the psalms that Dave read earlier from that 80th psalm, that cry that repeats in that psalm again and again, restore us, O God, make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. That's the longing the psalmist has. There are pieces in this image that represent the faithfulness of Jesus the way that he walked, the way that he talked, and the way he healed and restored. There are pieces that tell us all about his love and his compassion. And there are pieces that tell us about his death, his suffering, the bruises, all of that redemptive affliction. Those blood red stains on our hands, they are covered. They are covered by a deeper red, the reconciling red of Jesus' own blood. And this is the whole story. Each of those smaller stories tells a part of the truth. And when we put them all together, we see the true scope, the grand scale of God's perfect plan. That great rose window tells us the big story of God's love. It tells us how even though that we are broken, even though we're messed up, even though we have stained hands, that God still loves us, that God still wants us saved. It tells us the story of Jesus, Jesus who was born, 
just like you and I are born, but lived in a way that we never could. We see the story of his perfect wisdom, his compassion in his words and his deeds. We see his own great love in the way that he was willing to bear the consequences of our sin, to bear the weight of our transgressions, the bruises for our iniquities. So looking at the whole window, it helps us understand that Emmanuel, God with us, is not constrained to the manger. It's not kept there in the stable, but breaks out into eternity. This is the one who was with God and was God in the beginning, as John's gospel tells us, and the one who will be seated on the throne in eternity to come, as the revelation reveals. The whole window, all of it, tells a story of a God who loves us so much that he would send his son so that we could be saved. Those great cathedrals with their shining stained glass windows, they remind us of the way that God wants us to get the whole picture. When we don't understand things, when we don't understand the language, when we can't read the words, God wants to show us an image, show us a picture, and we can't get the whole picture if we're up too close to it. These these things are pretty, <laughs> these individual pieces. They draw our attention. I, it's, it's Christmas. Why wouldn't we want to pay attention to that? It's beautiful. The little parts of the whole, they illuminate us. They give us wisdom. They give us insight, for sure. And we can see more clearly by that illumination. But there's something that happens when we only look at part of the story, when we only focus on just a bit of it. Well, that's our efforts to maybe control the whole of it. See, we make it about us and not about what God is doing. We pick and choose. I like that part of the Bible. Mm, that over there I'm not so much about. We pick and choose what we want to pay attention to. The Christmas part of the story, who doesn't like that? It's beautiful. It's inspirational. It's got some of the most vibrant colors that we'll ever see. But we can't just look at that part of the window. If we want to see the true beauty of the whole of it, if we really want to see, be illuminated by this, then we need to step back and see all of it, even our own part in it. So this is what I want to encourage you to do. Step back. Step back and see the whole thing. When we're not distracted by those individual pieces and those pictures, when it's not just about mangers and shepherds and angels when it's not just about what Isaiah tells us about, our, our blood-stained hands and our transgressions, when it's not just about the wisdom and the compassion of Jesus' his ministry and, or even his suffering on the cross and the vibrancy of the resurrection, when we can step back far enough to see that it's all about God's love, then we're starting to see the whole of it. We're starting to see that it's not about us but about God's love, God's redemption, about salvation. And I'll tell you, that is a joyous picture. It is a wonderful thing to be loved by God. Oh, Christmas. Christmas comes around once a year, and sometimes we're tempted to pack it up when the new year rolls in, put it away for the year. Get back to that heavy load that we're carrying. But Christmas is a key piece of this beautiful image that God is creating. And, and we can see that if we're not too focused on the individual picture of Christmas or whatever it is. When the angels sang that song, joy to the world. Well, that wasn't just Christmas joy. That was salvation joy. Salvation joy. Joy that God's perfect plan is now being realized that true peace now becomes an eternal reality and so for this season take in the whole picture step back and look at the whole thing be illuminated by the whole story christmas it's a wonderful part of this beautiful rose window that god has created but it is only a part it is in the whole image where the true beauty and the true joy 
are found. For our prayer today, on the back of your bulletins, you'll find a responsive reading. We're going to share in prayer today. I invite you to take that. And it's pretty self-explanatory. You all got it? Nobody's confused here. You get to read the bold print. Joy, your love for us is unmeasurable. Joy, you send your son to take our place. Joy, you wanted to have a relationship with us forever. Joy, you are with us through our trials. Joy, you comfort us in times of sadness. Joy, you give us peace in times of uncertainty. We confess our own selfishness in choosing our own happiness through things and people over the joy you give so freely through your son Jesus. We choose the joy you give to everyone that believes in you. And in the name of Christ, we pray these things together. Amen. If you would all join me one last time as we sing the first verse of Joy to the World. I want to remind you that there is something the deacons have prepared for you. There's a little bag of Christmas goodies. Please uh, grab one of those on your way out. Um, that is uh, well, getting, getting kicked off. Going to have a little something special on the way home. So make sure that you have an opportunity to take one of those. If you would bow with me for our final prayer. Lord, you do bring us joy. It is a joy to be your people. It is not always easy because we have to recognize how much we depend upon you. But in the precious gift of your Son, in the way that you inspire us and equip us with your Spirit, we find true joy. Lord, it is joy that we want to take into the world. We want to share it with others. We want them to know about your love too. And so as we depart from here, we ask that you would give us opportunities to share love with family, with friends, with people that we encounter. We want to shine that light and be illuminated and illuminate as we are your witnesses and representatives in the world. Bring us together again so that we can praise you and worship you. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. We'll see you on Christmas Eve. You may go in peace.